Welcome to the Good and Basic Podcast, a long-form conversation about our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash goodandbasic, the projects we do on them, interspersed with occasional philosophic meanderings. Uh, I'm Joseph Fisher, and this is Joseph York, the two co-hosts of the YouTube channel, so here we are. It's good to be here, as always. Um, We'd also like to invite you, if you uh, are listening to the podcast on YouTube, you may want to check out the audio-only version on a variety of podcasts. You can go to anchor.fm slash goodandbasic to find those links. Uh, if you're listening to the podcast and don't know about the YouTube channel, go ahead and check out youtube.com slash goodandbasic to see all the videos we reference. Um, we'd also invite you, if you're so inclined, to follow us on Twitter. Handle is at goodandbasic. There we post a variety of quotes, mostly. And, uh, of course, on Instagram, Instagr- uh, our handle is good underscore and underscore basic. That is correct. And that's project teasers and other little snippets that don't make it all the way. To Still figuring out, though. So, well, good, good fun. Uh, all right. Well, uh, you may have noticed that our location is not our typical one. Yes. Uh, welcome to my shop, by the way. Um, this is where a lot of the projects for the channel end up being prototyped. So in this bin, we've got odds and ends that I've finished. In that bin, currently I'm working on some flint napping projects. And surrounding us, oh, in the corner, that's 45 pounds of wool. So that's good. Things awesome. to look forward to. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, kind of like our YouTube channel, right? Just tons of interesting odds and ends, I would say. Yes. So, and so there you go. The theme with all of them is exploration. We're trying yeah. to learn things and grow and and become awesome. So so good deal. Yeah. Um, so what we were thinking about talking about today is we wanted to revisit... Uh, well, this actually brings up another thing. So last week, obviously, if you're a regular listener to the podcast, you know we missed our regular episode last week. We were traveling in southern Utah. And uh, since we were traveling, we... Um, well, yeah, actually, let's mention that first. We may as well tell them what we were doing in Southern Utah. There's yeah. Video will be coming out about this soon, but since you're a podcast listener, we'll go ahead and uh, spill the beans right now for you. So the thing we were doing was searching for iron ore down in Iron County, Utah. And there's a mine down there with tailings that we went to go visit. And up to this point, you know, we found some sources of iron ore. Many of you may remember looking for bog iron ore up in the mountains with Cody. And uh, this time we found gobs of the stuff. This stuff is really, really pure uh, magnetite. It's magnetic iron ore. It's a black stone, and we brought home, what, 300 pounds of it? Uh, estimates vary. A lot. A lot. <laughs> right. I, 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 keep try- I kept trying to compare the buckets we were carrying to, like, 50-pound sacks of flour and, like, 80-pound sacks of concrete, because I've hefted those, and so I was kind of trying to gauge, and I, gosh, I am not sure exactly. <laughs> uh, a lot. It came out to, I, I would say, about a very, very, very full wheelbarrow load. Full yeah, it, enough to affect Probably. the performance of the car just a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, 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 the, the back was sitting just a little lower. Anyway, so uh, that will be really exciting. We're hoping to get a couple more smelts done this summer. Yeah. Uh, so that should be something real fun to look forward to for us and for all of you. So that's good. And for your um, information, that was why we missed the podcast. Yes. Uh, gathering <laughs> iron ore in Southern Utah. Um, we're, we're hoping to get the podcast uh, up every week, regardless of whether or not we're doing a work trip or something like that. But uh, that's, that's a work in progress. So thank you for bearing with us. This week, we're going to be discussing a couple of the projects from last week. This week was a, a series of videos all about uh, gathering and smelting tin ore and then smelting copper, and then mixing those two metals to create bronze. And then we cast bronze swords, and bronze axes, and a uh, and a bronze brooch that's a work in progress at the moment. Mm-hmm. So we got to try out a few different methods, including a very modern rammed sand construction, and also very ancient uh, cob jackets for lost wax casting. Yeah. So it was, I mean, this week has probably been one of the most, like, complete series of projects that we've ever done, right? Where we posted the videos where we went to the Cornish tin mines, right? So we were in the mines, okay? Then we took tin ore, made it into tin, took copper ore, made it into copper, took the copper and tin, not not those particular coppers and tins, but uh, but copper and tin put them together to make bronze, right? So we we moved straight from, we like moved straight into the iron, or excuse me, the bronze age in a series of four videos, basically. Which is so cool. (laughs) I I need to say, I need to geek out for just a second because that deserves geeking out. Um, we made bronze. We made all the constituent elements of bronze, then we made bronze, and then we made things out of bronze, including useful tools. Mm-hmm. Parenthetically, uh, it's also good to mention a uh, uh, big shout out to Neil Burridge and Will Lord. Neil Burridge helped us with the uh, tour of the Cornish tin mines and also the smelting of the tin. And then uh, with Will Lord, we did the, the smelting of the copper and the making of bronze uh, implements. And so, uh, you know, with their, their expertise was just totally invaluable. They took us on an excellent, excellent adventure. Absolutely. So, 
That was amazing. We'll uh, link to their respective websites and et cetera in our show notes so that you can find them in case you haven't already found them from the YouTube channels. So there we go. Yeah. Um, and it, so, so we wanted to discuss that, but I think there was something else you wanted to mention too from, from the Bushcraft show videos that we didn't get to talk about. Is that yes. now, is now um, the right time to tackle that? Yeah, let's go yeah. into that. Um, so there was a sequence of those four videos all about bronze casting. Uh, while we were at the Bushcraft show, we filmed a video about hollowing out a dugout canoe. And the cool thing about this particular uh, interactive display was that they had axes and adzes of a whole bunch of different kinds. They had polished uh, flint axes, they had a copper axe, they had a uh, bronze axe, and bizarrely enough, they had an adze made out of the tibia of a cow. So we're talking about a bone, a sharpened bone implement being used to carve wood. Mm -hmm. And I got a chance to try this thing. And what shocked me was that it worked. I mean, you could carve out an entire dugout with a shin bone. I mean, a hafted, you know, uh, tool made out of a shin bone, but mm -hmm. a shin bone yeah. nonetheless. Yeah. Out of a shin bone. Right. Yeah, well, this is, the, I mean... It... Yeah, it was quite mind-blowing. Uh, you you had quite the reaction to it while we were there, um, which which is very fair, right? And, and you mentioned uh, something along the lines of that, uh, you know, you think about modern tools and primitive tools, and what you tend to think is that, oh my gosh, primitive people had it so hard. It must have been like, uh, gosh, I'm trying to think of a good comparison, right? Like the difference between driving and walking, where like, you would never go back and walk 17 miles now if you could drive, right? Yeah. If you could, or take public transportation, Uh and, and, and you mentioned, well, do you want to go ahead and unpack that a little further? In, yeah, in the, the thing that uh, was, was difficult for me to understand uh, was that you could do it. Like, in my mind, you could kind of play at it for a few minutes and then realize, oh my gosh, this is terrible, I'm never going to finish this canoe, and then stop. But working on it there for a few minutes, I could see how with some patience and with that technique, even though it's primitive, it, I mean, that's pre-Stone Age. This is, this is old, old, old school. Um... Well, I guess you would shape the bone with stone, so I, it, concurrent with Stone Age, but pre-metal because you don't have metal tools. Mm -hmm. Even in that context, you could finish a canoe using a shin bone. And in my mind, uh, th there's this little part of me that looks at ancient technology, looks at primitive technology, and says, you know, it must be so horrible to do that that you couldn't actually do it. I'm taking my modern person bias where I lack the skill, the know-how, and the patience to be able to do this thing in a completed form, to live a complete life without this technology that I take for granted, i.e. metals. Mm -hmm. And without metal-edged tools, it is possible to not only, you know, not only do some things, but to do all the things it would take to stay alive and live a reasonably comfortable, reasonably sufficient life. Well, and this is a thing, yeah, I, I, I mean, I agree 100%. I think this is an interesting thing, kind of expanding on that thought process, the thought process portion of that a little more, that uh, it seems like we often tend to look at pre-modern peoples and we think, oh, their lives must have been very awful. Yeah. Right. And the answer is, well, probably not. I mean, the modern world has some very clear advantages, right? Medicine is, you know, first, first on the list in my mind, right? Penicillin, heck of an invention. Um, but, but, uh, what it makes me think is, you know, I, I think we sort of imagine pre-modern, pre-modern peoples as, as living in misery all the time and never being able to get anything done. It's like, no, like they, you know, the, what the, to me, the lesson that bone adds seems to be, uh, you know, whatever your circumstances are, sort of whatever tools you have on hand, you actually can lead a pretty darn fulfilling life. You can do right? it and, and, and can do a lot of very impressive stuff, no matter who you are, no matter what you've got on hand. You can complete the task. You can do the thing. You can do the verbs of living with, you know, these primitive tools yeah. reasonably well. I mean, it's the same verb. Yeah. That's the thing that blew my mind. In, and it was so clear specifically in carving the dugout because every single one of those tools did the same thing. Mm -hmm. All of them were able to complete the job. For, I mean, the, the tibia adds, its job is to cut into a piece of wood and pry off chips in order, so that you can hollow it out. And it does it. It carves out chips. You can do the job with the tibia. And then you move up to, say, the, the stone adds. The stone adds does it slightly more effectively. I mean, it is doing the same job. And it's not, it's not that the one does the job partially. All of them do the job completely. They, I mean, they do the same thing. The difference was that they were faster. 
when I got to try the copper ads, I mean, it cuts significantly faster and deeper and more effectively than the bone one, but it's doing the same job. You know, I'm thinking of another really good illustration of this that's relevant to the, to the, to the tin mines, right? So one of the things we went over with Neil Burge, if I recall correctly, is that these tin mines are, are being picked out, you know, potentially uh, very, 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 very early. Yes. Right. Uh, and so I was thinking about, you know, a comparison. You mentioned having all four of those ads is next to each other and being able to test each one. Yes. Concurrently, right? So um, I was thinking, you know, we'll imagine like walking, riding a horse, driving a car, and then an airplane, right? So we flew over to Europe. And if you asked me to walk to Europe and then sail in a ship, I'd be like, dude, you are crazy. Yeah. Right. But people actually did that. Yeah. Right. People actually did that and got tin from Cornwall. Right. I mean, Columbus did this. Leif Erikson did this. Ibn Battuta did this. Uh, the Polynesians did this. All kinds of people did exactly that. Right. So the thing that I think about now is like, oh, it would be impossible for me to go to Europe without an airplane. It's like, well, no, you, you definitely could. Yeah. People did that. And we, when I make praise. I need to make a comment about these stone tools versus bone tools versus modern, more modern tools versus bronze tools. When carving up the dugout, the difference in time is not a small difference. I mean, if you spend however much of your life carving out dugout canoes, and suddenly you can cut three times as fast, that is a significant difference. It makes a big difference. Yeah. You can make three times as many canoes in the same amount of time, or you could spend two-thirds as much time doing something else. And so, like jump-starting agriculture, or taming sheep, or playing with your kids or doing other stuff. I mean, going to Mars. There's a statistic that people used to spend one, up to one third of their waking hours working on making clothes. So that's things like shearing sheep, spinning wool, uh, weaving that wool into cloth, and then stitching that cloth into garments and then washing it. Like this is something that takes a third of the time that you are awake on average. And that's ludicrously crazy to me. I mean, modern people, we... I mean, you could spend a lot of money. I, for I would the, be curious what the breakdown is, like how much of my year I spent working in order to clothe myself. I don't think it's very much. I think it's like, I don't know, a few days. Yeah. So one percent of my year, two yeah. percent of my year, not a third, not a third. No, <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. So it's. I mean, it's a twofold thing. Modern technology offers a lot of advantages: time, efficiency, and efficiency is a really interesting point. But the thing that blew my mind was that you could do the job completely with the primitive tool. And it's the same, it's such a cool microcosm because it's the same job. Yeah. Super cool. Um, you want to talk about we, efficiency yeah. for a minute? Uh, actually, I was thinking of bringing that up a little bit later, if that's okay. Oh, oh, actually, no, I do want to talk about efficiency. So one of the things that made me think is, uh, we talked, uh, well, so, so the bronze tools are more efficient. Yes. But they do the same job that the bone tool did. Yes. So this is really interesting because in the modern world, we're very fond of tools that are, let's say, like hyper-effective, right? Uh, think about your computer. Your computer can do a lot of stuff. A yep. lot of stuff, right? Um, so many things that you haven't even scratched the potential of that computer, right? Um, and yet, we seem to spend a lot of that time on the computer just watching cat videos or watching YouTube videos like this one or... Or, or any of a number of other things, right? Like, I mean, the computer can, in theory, be used to, you know, spread the most important ideas across the globe, right? Uh, or, you know, or you think of, like, the Arab Spring, it can be used to, to bring about political change. You think about, like, great novels, you know, you could write the next great American novel on this thing, you know? You could, you know, I, I mean, uh, movies like Avengers Endgame were edited on, on a computer like this, right? Like, there are so many amazing things you could do with this computer, and, and yeah. you don't really scratch that potential at all. And so I was just thinking, it's very interesting that, uh, you know, it's almost like a bird in the hand versus two in the bush type arrangement where sometimes it's better to have a simple tool uh, and do the job than to have a very powerful tool and not take advantage of it. You know, like the fact that my computer can edit Avengers Endgame, useless to me. Useless. Right? That's something that, and that's just a bit of untapped potential that will never come into actuality. Right? So it doesn't actually do me any good. Right? I wonder how long it would take to render that. <laughs> Long, long time. Um, but but like I think about the bronze tools, and I think that, uh, I, I, you know, the bronze tool does it better, and you can do a lot of things with bronze that you can't do with bone, perhaps, right? But uh, it's better to have a bone adds and a canoe than to have a bronze adds and no canoe. Sure. 
the, the, the counter, obviously, is that your bronze adds can be used to make lots of canoes, but then so can your bone adds. So. Yeah. Um, it, the, the bronze adds becomes useful once there's a canoe involved, let's put it that way. I'm not sure I'm understanding your point. Um, well, let me let me try to spell it out a little bit more then. Um, again, the bird in the hand versus two in the bush thing, right? Where if you have a simple tool that does the job, that's better than having a very complex tool that can do lots of, that has lots of functions that you never use. Sure. Does that make sense? And there seems to be, in the Wasted modern world, a fetishization of functionality that isn't actually used. One thing that I find really interesting is... It's sort of the way, if you don't mind me interjecting, the yeah. way that your speedometer goes up to like 120 or 140 miles an hour, but you've never gone 120 to 140 miles an hour. It's just a marketing gimmick that convinces you that the car can go that fast, hypothetically. Who knows? One thing that I'm interested in is this engineering phrase that close enough is close enough and good enough is good enough, where a lot of the things that I do... Um, so, actually, I'm going to reach over and grab my angle grinder right here. This is an angle grinder that I purchased from Harbor Freight for $14. And I can't tell you how much it has improved my quality of life when working on things out here in the shop. Um, now, a lot of craftsmen have really negative feelings about Harbor Freight because it's not the most effective, the most efficient. Mm -hmm. Like when you are buying tools, there's this idea that, I mean, you buy quality because quality is what lasts and your tools will take care of you and you want only the very, 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 very best. And I, I understand that line of reasoning, and I even like it. But the thing that I really like about Harbor Freight is the low barrier to entry, where for me, getting access to the tool that will do the job, even if it's not the best tool, mm -hmm. is more important than getting the best tool or than having no tool at all until I can get the best yeah, one. Yeah, it makes it so that you can have an angle grinder. You start yeah. with, your, with your bone adds. Yeah, I have and my hey, bone that's, adds. That's good enough for now. Would you rather have a bronze adds? Sure. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Incidentally, uh, Harbor Freight is not sponsoring this video, although I wouldn't object <laughs> if they decided they wanted to, because I love Harbor Freight. Uh, um, yeah. Anyway, that, 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 that's something that's interesting to me, is mm -hmm. because rather than waiting until it's the best thing that it can possibly be, I have this kind of intermediate, not quite as good thing that, you know, it's hypothetically not as good, it's not as efficient or as effective, but it will do the job. See. And when I compare this to hand sanding, or like oh, yeah. working on projects where I'm, I'm grinding metal or cutting yeah. pieces of metal. Like the alternative is a hacksaw. Well, here, let me let me try to make, because you were not sure what point I was making earlier, and I think you're making a pretty similar point to what I'm making. Another example of this would be how we got started blacksmithing. So I was working at, an, or at a living history museum in Utah uh, in the blacksmith shop, which was pretty cool, and you invited me over one day, and we made a forge with paving stones, charcoal briquettes, an air compressor, a claw hammer, and a post-anvil yeah, it was made of like a I, I, a piece of cold rolled steel about three inches in tiny, diameter, tiny, right? Yeah. And it, you know, garbage equipment. But we worked with it and we made stuff. That yeah, I believe we made forks, right? So, so again, right? Like this is the bird in the hand is worth two in the bush thing that I was talking about earlier. Is that you know, like close enough is close enough, good enough is good enough. And if you have something, it's better to do something with what you have than it is to wait around for something better to come. Yeah, gosh, that's a really empowering idea. Yeah, because the the fundamental idea there is that I mean. You don't don't wait for the best opportunity. Wait for I mean, jump on the opportunity that you happen to have. Yeah, and yeah, exactly. Actually, this you know, I think this is the part where we start invoking Taoist philosophy a little bit. So one of the things that fascinates me. Um, so 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 the Tao is the way, right? Yes. And and something that's interesting to me, uh, from my understanding of Taoism, is that um, or or at least the way that I suppose I choose to understand Taoism is that the way is always right in front of you, right? The, the first here, the first step is always right in front of you, right? And so, and so, yes, like you know, someday you hope to have a better shop than this, absolutely. But but that doesn't discount the value that it's giving you now, and it would be, it would be foolish or or even criminal or maybe even immoral of you to just sit and do nothing until you could get a perfect shop. Yeah, like that's that's just not a good idea. Another example is actually the garden. So this is a rental home that I'm living in, and I have this tiny patch of garden, and it's not enough to grow all my food. So maybe I could say not, why Why try? Why, why grow vegetables in a 10 by 10 patch? Yeah. When my dream is to eventually have, you know, to, the, a garden of the size that would require an hour a day. Mm -hmm. You know, the kind that's really, really significant, substantial. As, um, as somebody who grew up on a garden like this, trust me, you will get it, and I hope you like it. <laughs> I will. Um, okay. And do you know how I know that? Do you know how I know I'm going to enjoy go that? Go ahead, go ahead. Um, because I am gardening on my 10 by 10 patch, 
And even though it's not enough to feed me, I started with my 10 by 10 patch, and then I found out that there was this abandoned garden over across the way, um, not on my property, that I could go and garden, and I had permission to use. And so I started gardening that patch, and now I water both of those patches every day, and when I finish every day, I'm hungry for more. And so I now have knowledge, embodied knowledge, that I do actually enjoy gardening. And how do I know that? Because I've been gardening. Uh, very fair. I'll keep my teasing about gardening to a minimum. <laughs> so, and my kids might not like it so much, but you know, we'll wait a generation to see that one. You know, sorry. So we really did want to talk about bronze casting today, and we are in just one second here. But uh, for, for me, it's worth lingering for just one more second on that lesson, just because I, I, I think it's so important. And I think, gosh, I think, I, I don't know. I just think that lesson is so incredibly important that the right approach to life is to lift where you stand. Or I think there's another phrase like bloom where you're planted, right? Yeah. And it's like, hey, you know, look around. You may not like where you're at. And, and very fair, there's probably lots of problems with your at. They're pro where you're at. There probably are. And when you think right. it's terrible, just remember that people well, have carved dugouts with rocks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, maybe it is terrible, and that's very fair, right? Like, sure, sure. No, no, like, I, I don't mean to discount that, right? But but the there just doesn't seem to be much good in waiting for better circumstances. You seem to have to work with what you've got. And it seems like if you do that, you actually do... Um, open up realms of satisfaction that weren't available to you previously previously like it actually is a way to to approach it actually is a legitimate way to approach difficult circumstances it's a really cool thing and i like how you focus on satisfaction there because that i mean it feels good to have done what you can yeah yeah even if it is a bone adds worth yeah <laughs> absolutely Absolutely. So making making a jump, um, yes. one of the things Onto that we bronze. got to try in bronze casting, so again, huge thank you uh, to Neil, and that thank you to Will Ward. That was incredible. <laughs> uh, walking around through the tin mines, I want to share a story about the tin mines real fast. Um, mining tin is incredibly difficult, and one of the reasons why people would do it in Cornwall is because it was considerably poor, and one way that you could make some money if you needed it was to go and find this rock and sell it on. And so, I mean, they found basically all of it. Finding tin now in Cornwall is a really rare thing. We think we found one tiny vein, maybe. 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 Tin, uh, Neil, uh, sorry, uh, Neil Burridge showed us this tin stone that he had, and it was amazingly dense. Like, this thing looked like a regular rock, and then I held it, and it felt like lead. It was just enormous, enormously heavy. And uh, he considered this, like, this a treasure, this thing that he had found, which supposedly it's basically all gone. But uh, the tin mines are incredibly dangerous places to work. Uh, in Roman times, the way they used to mine was by building a big fire up against the wall and then splashing water on it to make the rock shatter. Um, Which is actually really smart. It's brilliant it's until really you smart. imagine you're lighting this fire in confined underground spaces. And then who's the poor sap who's going to throw the water on it? Yeah, carbon monoxide flying. I don't know. The shards fly. or might if it explodes. Yeah. Not to mention there's the heat, you know, building up in an enclosure. Oh, I'll and just it's it's kind of brilliant. It's kind of brilliant as long as you're not the one going down the hole. Um, yeah. Well, to me, that's a definite qualification on brilliance, right? Like, yeah. Gosh, a little bit terrible there. So anyway, as you were. Anyway, so super dangerous conditions, and then it stays dangerous all the way up through the pick era, all the way up into the era where they're using dynamite. The crazy. Uh, would you mind clapping too? The crazy thing that I love about this adventure that we had was that I got the tiniest, tiniest taste of the danger of the mines. There was water on this, the bottom of this mine shaft mm -hmm. that was tunneling into the mountain and we were walking along there and, you know, I didn't want to get my feet wet so I was kind of trying to wall crawl along the side and my hand slipped and I bashed my head against the, the side of the, the tunnel. No hard hats, no safety equipment and we paid for it just the tiniest bit. I'm grateful we didn't pay more because, you know, I could have just passed out in the water and that would have been the end. Well, I mean, we were there. We would have found you, I think. Yeah, you would have noticed. That. I mean, I might have left you, but I would have found you. So. <laughs> there we find things out. You find out how your friends are. Neil wouldn't have left you. you. Neil no. would have made me bring him. True, true. So, yeah, so always bring Neil. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, yeah, yeah. Good. Uh, so that was a, that was an interesting adventure. Um, hard won stuff. I mean, the, the effort to get mm -hmm. it is interesting. And then, uh, the whole process, seeing it all together, was amazing. And then one of the things I really liked when we were casting with Will Ward is that he showed us not one technique. 
I mean, he easily could have said, I'm going to teach you some casting. This is one way to do casting. We're done. Instead, he showed us how to make clay jackets out of cob for lost wax casting. This is super primitive. You need beeswax, you need horse manure, you need uh, ceramic that's previously been fired, and you need mud. Like, these are the ingredients you need to make casting molds. And he showed us how to do it, and it was really cool. And then he showed us how to do it with sand, with uh, sand that's oil bonded so that it sticks together in modern frames, and he thought that was cool. And that's very similar to green sand casting, which we've been doing for hundreds of years, uh, really just the last couple hundred years. And then the, uh, the last technique he showed us was one with a silica sand that was bonded together with uh, carbon dioxide gas. It was uh, sodium silicate. And that was really cool. I mean, so far away from primitive, but still he was showing us multiple techniques so that we could see the commonalities and see how this process of casting, taking molten metal and pouring it in a mold, has evolved over time. Yeah, you know, actually, that seems like the right place for me to make an observation about Will. So spending time with Will was amazing. Something that really struck me about him that I wasn't necessarily expecting was uh, his his uh, exploratory approach to things. So I came to him and I wanted to make uh, kind of like a, a safety pin type thing, a brooch, right? And and I, I had this kind of fairly finely detailed thing in mind. Um and I said, well, hey, like, do you think it's going to work with this lost cast waxing? Or do you think that the... the lost the, cast waxing? Lost lost wax casting. Thank yes. You. And uh, do, like, you know, do you think the detail is too fine to work with this method? And he was like, well, I'm not sure. Give it a try and see. Right? And uh, that was his approach at so many junctures during this whole process is I would say, well, you know, well, what do you think about this? Like, would this work? And he was like, well, I don't know. You should give it a try and see. Right? And so it was very interesting to see somebody who is highly competent in all these things and is still in that exploratory frame of mind and always trying to push the limits of his of his knowledge and his his range of abilities. Yeah. And that was that was really cool to watch. And it's reflected in the fact that we went through three different casting methods. Yeah, yeah, it is. And he was doing the exploring. I guess the, the sodium silicate was something that he was currently experimenting with. Um one thing that's interesting about Will Ward is that he is an expert in uh, a, the area of focus that he really likes is the Paleolithic. And so he'll do Neolithic stuff and he'll do Bronze Age stuff. And he, I mean, obviously lives in the modern life, so he does modern stuff too. But, I mean, he's interested in learning how to live at all of these different levels of technology, which mm -hmm. seems to be a really interesting thing. Well, that's exploration. very interesting to us too, yeah. right? Uh, because we like the Stone Age. But we also like the Bronze Age, but we also like the Iron Age, but we also like the Computer Age, and oh, paper's nice, and I already mentioned that I like penicillin. Airplanes are pretty cool, too. Who doesn't like solar panels, 3D printers, right? Yeah. So, so uh, you know, it's very interesting to us, I think, to see somebody who is trying to harmonize across all those levels of technology yeah. rather than just exploring one of them. Right. Right. So, the, the, well, that was, that was cool. You know, it seems to me that that's something that uniquely we have an interest in. You know, one of the things in that exploratory mode that I'd like to bring out is we lit a fire. And this is something that I've been working on for a long time. I've been trying to get friction fires to work properly. And Will Ward introduced us to the, the ancestor of flint and steel. Rather than flint and steel, you're using an iron pyrite. This is uh, chemically, it's, uh, uh, it's iron sulfite, I believe. I do not remember. And it's, uh, iron pyrite is also called fool's gold. It's usually in square crystals out here in the Western United States. But uh, if you find a nodule of the stuff and it's round, it ends up, if you break it apart, it has like a feathered pattern where it kind of looks like a frozen uh, a frozen seed pod from a dandelion plant. That's the made little white one, not the, not the yellow one, but yes. after it's ready to be blown. When it's, when it's this big poofy thing. It's like a, almost like a, like a, gosh, I wouldn't even know, like a sunburst almost. Like yes. It just radiates outwards. Three-dimensional sunburst. Yeah. And if you find a rock that's got this kind of, uh, that is chemically and physically shaped this way, and you break it in half, you can actually draw sparks off of it. They're not very hot sparks. They're, they're kind of orange, and they don't last for very long. And if you strike it with a flint, you can make these sparks. But the question is, can you light a fire with this? And Will showed us how to light a fire with this. So, and if you've seen the video, you know it was, it was pretty funny, right? So he had us all try, right? None of us could do it at first. And then, and then he went and lit a spark, on, uh, put it onto the, onto the fungus, and got the spark going. And we were like, oh, you know, good job, Will. That was wonderful. And then he sticks his thumb on it puts it out and we're like why'd you do that he's like you're gonna do it so yeah and you did it 
Um, I did. I did. Over the course of that, uh, of our two days there, I, was it on day two? It was day two. It? it was day two that I managed to do it. So on day two, we're working on casting. Joseph goes over to the corner where the where the Marcus site, that's this. There's, there's just right. a little bit of a lull. I don't have anything to do, so. And you sit there and you're working sparks <laughs> and you're making sparks and you're making sparks. And then you have to brush off all the spark material from the fungus to keep it because that actually makes a barrier that stops it from lighting. Yeah, all the, the shards of, 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 of flint and Marcus site that have landed. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, yeah, so you 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 get the it, it's a it's an involved process, right? And it, you may know this if you tried to do even flint and steel type stuff. Is you know I had to get the spark and then I had to get it onto the fungus. I don't know if you recall the name of the fungus. I think it wasn't an amadou fungus. Amadou is the one that everybody talks about that grows on birch trees. It was a different one. I'm not sure what it was. Fungus X, fungus X, right? So you land a spark on there and it just smolders. It's just an ember, right? And then you rip out a little piece of the fungus and stick it inside a tinder nest and, and blow on it a little bit. And then you wrap that inside a straw nest and blow on it a little more. And eventually you, you get it to light into fire, right? Yeah. And it, <laughs> I, 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 I was at it for, I think, like 20 minutes, just spark after spark after spark. And there were quite a few times, you know, I, I get embers. Uh, I, I, none of the embers went out. The, the fungus was really good at holding the embers. But, you know, you, you put your ember in your nest and blow on it. And then I wouldn't manage it quite right, and it would blow out. And so I, I wait. So it was on phase two. So you got the spark. Oh, I, I think I think it was my third nest. I think it was my third nest, right? And it was discouraging the first time I got a spark because, you know, it's hard enough to get a spark to land on the fungus, right? Yes. So that's difficult and, and to level catch. one. That's yeah. level one. And then, which incidentally, I did not pass. The, the, the first time I got the spark to land on the fungus and keep there, I was like, "Oh, this is amazing!" Right? Ripped out a little piece, put it in the in the tinder nest, and wrapped it in straw, and started blowing on it. And, and I got it to smoke and smoke and smoke, and I couldn't get it to burst into flames. And then it went out, and then I was back at square one. <laughs> yeah. And now <laughs> you're trying to put, from 20 trying to, to trying to put sparks back on the fungus. <laughs> you know, and so, well, I, I, think, I think I did about three nests, and I think on the third nest I, I, I got it to, to work right. But it was, it, was, it was an involved and difficult process. Yeah. Uh, very rewarding. Involved and difficult. So one thing that I'm super curious about when seeing this technique work is who is the first person who ever made that happen? Because here's the challenge. You've got this rock and you're like, I know what's going to be a useful thing with if my, I know what I'm going to do this afternoon. Cancel all my afternoon appointments. Like I don't need to be gathering food today. I don't need to be making clothes today. I don't need to be hunting anything today. I don't need to be taking care of some emergency today. I'm just going to hit a rock repeatedly. <laughs> Making sparks. Just smack two And then, you know, the other members of the tribe are sitting there looking at you and saying, what is Throg doing? And, and like, you're making sparks. And, like, I mean, there's got to be some conceptual link between sparks and fire, right? Yeah. I mean, still, you're you're just making sparks. You're not making fire. I'm not trying to imagine, like, some primitive... I'm not trying to imagine a cartoon Stone Age man where, you know, you're saying, you know, uh, 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 spark. Oh, my goodness. This is strange. I'm... So let's say you see the spark and you instantly make the connection. I've seen that on a fire before. Yeah. I've seen that. Yeah. I know what this is. Maybe I can make a fire. Okay, so now you have this theoretical picture in your head that says, okay, I can light a fire with this, hypothetically. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, what are you going to catch that spark with? <laughs> because, I mean, if you try to light a board of wood yeah, with this, work. nothing's going to happen ever. Yeah. And even if you have reasonably good tinder, like a tinder bundle, like, say, that nest, that straw, that's not going to catch either. No. So how are you going to find the perfect thing that's going to catch the spark? And how do you know that's the perfect thing that's going to catch the spark? And remember, you until don't have, it's caught the spark. And remember, you don't have char cloth. Yeah, right. So, so I suppose you're just sitting there, trying out. I, I don't even know how it was thought of. Right. But, but, but you might be sitting there trying. I don't know five materials, ten materials, a hundred materials. And how much? How long do you spend with each material before you give it up? Yeah, that's another. And so the question that I have in my head is, how much faith do you have to have in the idea that this could theoretically work? in order to put the effort involved to make it work. And that's the amount of raw faith, and that faith has to translate into, I am going to sit here, cancel my afternoon, <laughs> hitting sparks with a rock, which, by the way, mm -hmm. consumes the marcasite over time. Striking it at it actually carves into it. So you have to go find another lump of marcasite at some point. Yeah, and, you know, they're not everywhere. Yeah, so the, the person who did that, I'm just imagining that and thinking, wow, that is a person who has a lot of faith slash commitment in this, at up to this point, unproven idea. Yeah. That I can make fire. Yeah. With a rock. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, then, and then, let's say you get it right. I mean, the first time you get it right, you know that you can get it right with the spark the first time. But at that point, you're at least a little bit tired from having struck mm -hmm. 
the thing so often to get the spark, but then, I mean, there's still two or three more phases where you could fail. You know, it's so interesting to me because we, we really, my, my perception of our, of our social milieu is that we really like success. Gosh, we like success so much, you know, and, and it's important to specialize early, right? You need to, uh, you know, you don't have time to waste in things that you're not going to be good at because at some point you need to go be a, a professional, have a career and so forth. And so you need to figure out what you're good at and go pursue it, right? There's not, uh, not necessarily that much space to do things badly. Right. And this is something that, you know, hypothetically, this first person would have had to have done badly multiple times. Right. Oh, because, why? because I'm imagining that it's not just your first, you know, you don't just cancel your afternoon. Right. You probably work at it for like, I don't know, half an hour, an hour, and then you get bored and your hands hurt and you're like, that's enough for today. And tomorrow you have to pick up and do it again. Right. And, and so it's not just faith across the course of one afternoon, it's faith and commitment across the course of you know, multiple days and uh, comfort with failure too. Yeah. Comfort with failure because you're going to do a lot of that. Yeah. One thing that was shocking to me as I was working on it is Will uh, made a comment that was fascinating. He said, you have to believe that it's actually going to work. I think he actually told that to you. I yeah. overheard. But I have something to say about that in a moment because um, it was really striking. One thing that was interesting to me is striking. I was striking. <laughs> uh, Sorry. So striking. <laughs> I like yeah. that. I like that rather a lot. So yeah. I'm using this hand axe. I'm striking yeah. sparks into this uh, this tinder fungus. And every time I strike, you know, the first 15 strikes, I understand, well, maybe, maybe it'll take just a little longer. And I keep striking sparks, and they keep landing on the fungus, and they're not catching. So eventually, you know, maybe 30 strikes in, as I'm working on this, I start to wonder, do I have a defective fungus? <laughs> and then I keep striking and it's not working and suddenly it's not making sparks very well and I start thinking maybe I have a defective marcosite and so th there's all these moving parts right there's the marcosite there's the flint axe there's me and there's the yeah if you don't mind me interjecting something just kind of funny when I was doing it you know I've been going at it and I keep trying to get the sparks to land and I can't right um, for a while and what I actually thought was am I do I have a defective me right like am I doing the technique yeah right uh, it, it, I, I don't know <laughs> Right, and I didn't know. Anyway, so yeah, d d you know, defective me, defective marcosite, defective fungus, some combination of the above, some combination of the above, some unknown combination of the above. Yeah. Anyway, as you were, and then and then you find it. Uh, you had a comment about that uh, belief that it will work. Sure. Yeah. So so this is this was really interesting to me. It's it's just a hair abstract, but if you'll stick with me, I think there's a really important lesson um, to be pulled out of it. So so I'm I'm sitting there on day one, you know, whacking the flint against the marcosite, right. And, uh, and Will says, no, you have, to, you have to believe it's going to work. You have to believe that you can actually make sparks and fire out of this thing. Yeah. Right. And because I waited until the second day to go back and try again, I, I had some time to kind of sit on that and ponder that. And I, I just thought it was such an interesting thing for him to say, right? You have to believe that it's going to work. And so I've, I've been thinking about that um, in, in a variety of respects. And one important respect, I think, is what you brought out, right? This, this idea that you have to believe that it's a thing that can be done. Yes. Right. And, and especially the first person who's doing this does not know that it can be done. Right. And I, I, I started thinking about it a little more because as, as I started thinking about that phrase, you have to believe it will work. I was like, well, wait a second. I, I do believe that it will work. Of course I believe that it will work. I just watched Will do it. Yeah. You know, and I've read about this in books. I've heard about this. Like, I, of course I believe that, that it works. Of course I believe that you can light a fire with this thing. Right. And, um, and then, so I, so I started thinking about that a little more, right? Like, okay, so what does it mean? Well, you know, you have to believe it, it will work. In what sense do I not believe that it will work? And I thought, well, maybe it's that I don't believe that I can do it, right? Like, Will Lord can do it. Uh, you know, some expert can do it. I can't do it, right? And I, I thought about that for a while. And, and in some respects, that, you know, that, that's partially true, right? Like, it's one thing to see an expert do something. It's another thing to go and embody that and act that out yourself, right? That, that's a different ballgame, man. You know, like, no matter how much I watch Lionel Messi... You know, it, it, that doesn't mean that I can go out and do what Lionel Messi does, right? It doesn't work like that. Um, but I started thinking about it a little more, and I was like, well, no, I even believe that I could do that, right? Like, you know, Will Lord doesn't have any, I mean, he has a little more experience, but like he has two hands, I have two hands, he had a flint and marcosite, I have a flint and marcosite. Like, of course, of course I can do this. There's no reason in principle why I couldn't do it. Um, and that's when I caught the word in principle, right? So, uh, in, in, in principle, right? Like, I believe that in, in principle, in the abstract, in theory, I could do this, right? Like, I'm a human. Humans can light 
a fire with flint and marcasite, therefore, I mean, therefore I, I can light a fire with flint and marcasite, right? Um, but I didn't know, but I hadn't done it. Does that make sense? I didn't know that that I could do it in practice, not just in theory. So you've got two different types of knowledge. You've yes. got the theoretical knowledge, and yes. you know that that's possible the second you've seen... In theory, in, in the abstract. It. You, you've seen will do it, therefore yeah. you know it's possible. Yeah. For someone, you know, abstract, yeah. general, people yeah. can do this. And then there's the second question, which is, can I do this? Mm -hmm. And you don't know that yet. Yeah, and, and I there's only one way to get that. Well, knowledge. and I realized that I didn't believe it. And on the second day, I started believing it, and I lit the fire. So I think the reason why the reason why I'm drawing this fine distinction, you might be wondering that, and and I'm going to explain why it's such a why I'm drawing that fine distinction is, I ran across a quote a little while ago. Uh, somebody mentioned that one of the plagues of the modern world is that uh, we have the illusion that in principle we could do anything if only we wanted to, right? Like think about Duolingo, right? It has how, how many languages on it, right? And so you know, oh, in principle, I could learn any language I wanted to. Uh, but there's a difference between knowing that in principle you can learn any language you want to and actually going and learning the language. Yeah. And one's a heck of a lot more useful, right? Same thing with Google, right? Like Google has made it so you don't have to know anything because in principle you could know anything. Right? Yeah. But what that actually means in actuality is that you know nothing, right? Just like with Duolingo, the fact that in principle you can learn any language uh, too often means that in actuality you don't learn any languages. It's interesting because... As a person that you, not using Duolingo but having it on their phone, yeah. Um, the way that I, is that you? Uh, I, well, until recently when I deleted oh, yeah. the program. Oh, okay. But uh, <laughs> uh, the the interesting thing there is, you know, I know I have this knowledge that I can do it at any mm -hmm. time, and at any time, like now, later, I can do it at any time. Yeah. So that's that's cool. I mean, I could learn any language, and you know, I open a program in like four, and so I'm like, I am studying four different languages. That's pretty yeah. cool. And then, you know, I have better things to do, like, uh, I don't know, binge watching something. Yeah. Or, or even, you know, many of the other things that you've got going on. Sure. Right? Sure. There's a lot of things. And so, in theory, I know that I can learn these languages, and then it just drops off as a priority. Like, I just don't. Yeah. Well, you mentioned something kind of similar to this, I think, actually, a long time ago. You mentioned that you wanted to get back into stretching. Right? Yeah. Because you knew, sort of, in theory, in the abstract, that stretching actually does make you more flexible but you didn't, let's say, have personal knowledge of it, right? Like yeah. In some sense, if I recall correctly, you didn't really believe it. Yes. Um, and I actually did an experiment to try to build on that. Um, uh, what I did was I, I stretched and did splits every single day for 30 days um, to see if I could see a difference in before and after. Like a before and after picture involving me, you know, yeah. one where I could say, no, I've seen a change. Yeah. Um, this daily practice thing that I've that's been harped on by all my martial arts instructors since the beginning is a thing that could actually affect me. Like it would make a real difference. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I could go from being extremely not flexible to being reasonably flexible or even very flexible. Yeah. And so I, I did that for a month and I did see improvement. Was the improvement massive? No, it was bone ads level. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm chipping away here, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think we're going to make that a meme. Bone ads level. I mean, it'll get the job done if you're patient. Yeah. But uh the, the thing was, between day one and day 30, I mean, there was a difference. I was more flexible. Now, have I maintained that? Have I continued that for the other 365 days of that year? No, I didn't. Mm -hmm. But uh, I now am a little bit more flexible, and I know that I could be more. Mm -hmm. Gosh, that makes me want to go back into that project again. So, and I want to be clear, I'm not against abstract knowledge, right? In some sense, it was it was partially, you know, it's partially the fact that I watched Will do it. I watched somebody else do it that gave me confidence to go do it myself, right? So I, I do think there can be an organic, harmonious connection and flow between between abstract knowledge and personal concrete embodied knowledge, right? But but I, I, I think, at least what I think is going on is and perhaps it's a characteristic of the modern world. I'm not sure. It's easy to find in certain portions of the modern world, like Duolingo and Google. Right, that uh, that the the idea that we could learn or do anything in principle, you know, if only we wanted to, you know, if we took the time to do it, we could do it, uh, cheats us. It's it's a it cheats us out of what we could actually have, and it's, you don't know until you've done it. It's actually uh, it, it, it's illusory. It gives us the illusion of omnipotence. Here's the thing that I find fascinating about that distinction between theoretical knowledge and the practical knowledge of having done something is which one is easier to translate into the other? 
if you have personally done something, you understand its nuances and you can get, use that to gain theoretical knowledge very, very easily. Having done something allows you to understand theory. And maybe, as is often the case, maybe you understand the theory wrong, but it works. That's a funny thing I've noticed about uh, practical knowledge, things that you've done with your hands, is you might have kind of strange explanations for why it happens, aligning the particles and all that, but, um, yeah. but it works. And you can translate <laughs> practical knowledge into theoretical knowledge. The question is, how well are you able to translate theoretical knowledge back into practical knowledge? And I think that mm -hmm. step is actually more yeah. difficult than going the other way around. Uh, and I think I, I hypothesize out. it depends from person to person because I, I know people who are very good at both. I think, like for instance, I'm very good at moving about to abstraction and very bad at moving down to particulars. Um, although I, I, I think I know people who are quite a bit better at the, at the reverse. Um, yeah, no, absolutely right. And I think you're describing very well the, the harmonious connection that's supposed to exist between the two, being able to move from personal application out to abstract knowledge and back to personal application, right? Um, the, the, my my concern is that it just seems like so obvious. Maybe it's a product of television, right? Because television is so passive, perhaps. Who knows, right? And uh, there, you're not sure if the theory that you're learning actually is true. Like, uh, if you're yeah, learning about no firsthand experience, you're, if you're learning about airplanes or guns or survival shows, any of these three things, and you're learning about how those things actually work through movies, <laughs> you're hosed if you try to turn that into practice. Yeah, I I, I guess what I'm thinking is this. What, what I learned from that experience, not for the first time, not for the last time, is you want to be very, very wary of abstract knowledge. It has its uses, but it's so easy if you, if you, if you think about it the wrong way, if you approach it the wrong way, it's so easy for it to give you the illusion of competence when you actually don't have any. The illusion of competence, because competence is embodied. You have to have done it. You have to be able to do it. Yep. Yeah. Um, Anyway, so that's, gosh, that's a thing I think about, right? Is there's many things I could be in potentiality in theory, but the number one thing that I have to decide is who and what I'm going to be and do right now, today. Yeah. And is it good? Because we right. should do the good. Uh, if, if you don't mind us indulging in a literature reference from Brandon Sanderson's uh, Oathbringer, what is the most important step a man can take? The next one. The next one. And then the next one. And then the next one. And that brings us back to the Dao Te Ching reference. Uh, the journey starts here. Om Shanti Shanti. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you've enjoyed this uh, long conversation that started out with bronze casting and ended up all over the place uh, with the pursuit of the good and abstract knowledge um, and how we bring that back to the particular. And if you'd like to see more of our material, uh, again, go to uh, the podcast platforms where the Good and Basic podcast is to be found. Anchor.fm slash Good and Basic should give you the full list. And also the YouTube channel is where these projects that we're referencing are originally posted. Um, we want to thank you all again for listening. And, uh, well, I think that'll be all. Thank you.